All right, we're starting. Good evening, folks. I think you're all entering into our Zoom room. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello and good evening. And folks, if you're watching on YouTube, hello. We're glad that you're joining in. We've got folks here in our Zoom webinar and we've got folks tuning in on our live streaming. Really glad that you're here. We'll give it a couple minutes so folks can settle in. I see you all coming into the room. Thanks so much. Looks like we're at 16 people and counting. Um, so we will go ahead and get started shortly. But thank you so much for joining us on Wednesday afternoon. Took me a minute to think about what day it was, but I got, I landed there eventually. Um, let's see, Steve, I think we might have a few PowerPoint slides. Would you mind pulling those up? I will. Awesome, thank you. All right, so folks, as you settle into uh, the Zoom room, again, thank you so much for joining us both here and on YouTube. Uh, welcome to our public webinar on the cost saving refinements for the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge. My name is Allison Brown. I'm a facilitator with JLA Public Involvement and I'll be our moderator this evening. Um, our screen has gone away, but that's okay. It'll be back, I'm sorry. It'll be back, it'll be back. It's great, we're just gonna get it um, up and running. So I'll tell you a little bit about our webinar today as we get that uh, some of our slides back up. We are going to be presenting to you and giving you uh, some insight into the uh, refinements to the preferred bridge alternative and some of the cost saving uh, measures that the county is currently exploring. We're gonna be taking your questions tonight and trying to answer as many of them as we can. So folks who are out there in the audience, we can't see you, we can't hear you, but we know that you're there. I can see a lot of your names. Um, so if you're having dinner, if you're in your sweatpants, no big deal. You get to join from the anonymity of the internet. And uh, my panelists will introduce in just a minute. We'll be answering as many questions as we can this evening. So I think we can go on to the next slide. And this is all part of uh, a broader engagement effort. So if you have not yet participated in the online open house, that link is on the screen. Uh, this will hopefully supplement some of the information that is in that, um, in that online open house, but we invite you to, to join in and uh, share your thoughts and feedback. Again, we'll be answering your questions, but we wanna hear what you think about these things and please do join in in our online open house. We'll make sure that we drop that link uh, at the end of our webinar, but just if you're interested, go ahead and jot that down and we hope that you'll uh, be part of the many people who've already weighed in and hopefully you're some of them out there. All right, let's go to the next slide. So as we said tonight, we are going to be answering your questions. We're gonna do that through the Q&A function in Zoom. So folks, as attendees, you should see a little box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, it should be, might be at the top if you're on your phone or on the side if you're on the tablet, but that box says Q&A. If you open that up, you can type in a question. And when we get to the Q&A portion of our meeting, I'll be moderating those questions. Uh, so we'll hopefully answering, be answering some of the things that you have top of mind through our presentation. So if you want to hold your questions until we get through a short presentation that uh, Mike and Steve will, will run through in a second, we'll start moderating those when we open up our Q&A and um, get through as many as we can. If we're not able to get through all of your questions this evening, we will be taking those and uh, following up with our participants, I think with an FAQ share, maybe something we'll put on the, on the website. Mike's nodding. So I think uh, some additional information, if we're not able to answer your questions this evening, will be put online. Um, and we'll be sure that hopefully you can see that and we'll get you some answers. Um, if you are joining in on YouTube, just know that we won't be able to hear any of your questions. We won't be moderating any of the comments on the YouTube stream this evening. Um, so if you do have a question, get on that Zoom link and come join us in the Zoom room and get your questions in there. That's how we'll be taking those this evening. Um, but you can always get in touch Take that online open house uh, engagement opportunity, send us your questions, lots of ways to uh, find out more about the bridge and the cost saving um, refinements as we get into the information. Okay, folks, if, if also your video screen should freeze, if you're attending and something looks weird, you can always leave the meeting and come back in and hopefully that'll help resolve, it, resolve any issues. The old turn it off and turn it on again. It seems to work, so far so good. Uh, okay, let's go to the next screen. All right, so let's meet our panelists this evening. Uh, let's start off with Mike. And Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself for those who don't know you. 
Yeah, hi everyone. This is Mike Pullen with Multnomah County's Communications Office. I'm sort of the lead at the county for public information for the project. I've uh, been working on this project. Boy, I guess we're probably in about year five. We had a feasibility study that started even before this phase that we're in now. So look forward to uh, sharing what we're uh, studying these days with you all. Thanks so and hi, everybody. I am Steve Drahota with HDR. Um, I've been on the project for the same amount of time as Mike. Um, I am the design lead overall, taking us through this environmental study, the feasibility study, um, and looking forward to answering whatever questions you guys might have in preparation for your uh, visiting our online open house. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we are joined by some other uh, members of our team behind the scenes today. Um, but we're just really excited, folks. We've got 22 folks out there joining us in the Zoom room, so we're glad that you're here. All right, let's go to the next slide, and I think I'll tell you a little bit about our agenda for the evening. So, Mike and Steve are going to tell us a bit more about the project overall. If this is your first time tuning in to what's been going on with the uh, Burnside Bridge and getting it earthquake ready, we'll be sure to fill in some of the gaps and give you the short version of that five-year history that Mike referenced. And then we'll dive a little deeper into the cost saving refinements um, and some of the things that are being explored right now. Uh, and then we'll follow up with some of the community, community engagement and the next steps. So what you can look forward to seeing in the future. And then around 540, and uh, we, may, we may get through it a little quicker if possible, we'll start to take your questions and uh, moderate that Q&A portion of the meeting. So again, hopefully your questions will be answered, but we look forward to hearing from you and uh, answering those burning questions that you have. We will formally adjourn at six, but if we do have a lot more questions, we have a little bit of wiggle room at the end of this webinar and we can uh, answer some additional questions. I think our team is willing and ready to stick around for a little longer uh, if we're not we wanna answer a few more. So that's our agenda for the next hour and uh, let's get into it. So tell us a little bit more about the project. What's been going on? Thanks, Allison. Yeah, this is Mike. I'll be starting off. Uh, we can go to the next slide with a little project overview. Uh, this slide kind of talks about the purpose of this project and what's the problem we're trying to solve with the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project. Um, we live in earthquake country, even though we haven't had a recent major earthquake. Um, this slide kind of talks about the history of earthquakes in the Northwest uh, portion of uh, North America. Uh, we have these uh, major plates, tectonic plates that are, um, it's called a subduction zone where one plate's going underneath the other one. Um, this graph at the bottom shows 10,000 years of time and there's a red dot in 2021 where we are sitting today. And as you look back in that 10,000 years of history, those blue lines represent earthquakes that are a 9.0 or larger and the orange ones are an 8.0. Um, I'm from San Francisco originally, and I was looking up today what the Loma Prieta earthquake was when uh, I lived there in 1989, and that was under seven. So that was a major earthquake that wasn't you know, nearly as powerful as these ones we're looking at on this graph. So uh, the good news, I guess, is that we haven't had one in a long time. We haven't suffered from one in a long time. But the bad news is the longer that time goes with no earthquake, the more likely it is that we're going to have one. As you can see from this graph, it's going to it's gonna happen, it's not a matter of if, but when. And unfortunately, our infrastructure in uh, the Northwest, this risk wasn't really known until around the 1970s. So uh, that's after most of our uh, bridges were constructed. So we're, we're not ready for this big event. We're, that's the goal of this project is to get more prepared for it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a simulation and it's a little video that we'll start just to give you a little flavor. Uh, our engineering team uh, worked with some animators to show what would happen to the Burnside Bridge today if that major subduction zone earthquake were to happen. And basically the bridge ends up in the river. Um, you can watch the whole video on our website. Um, but we don't show the whole city falling into the river because we don't want to speak for other agencies and their bridges. But um, we have seen information that tells us that none of the other bridges in the downtown area are expected to be usable uh, after this event. It could be weeks, it could be months. In some cases, there'd be complete bridge replacements as would happen with the Burnside Bridge. Um, so next slide, please. Um, 
looking around the world, just to remind us what happens when an earthquake of this scale, uh, what it does to the infrastructure. Um, we show on this slide pictures from Chile. And in 2010, they had an earthquake, also I think a subduction zone quake that was um, a little bit below 9.0. So again, that is a really strong earthquake. I think it's an exponential increase in the numbers as you go up. So uh, a, a nine is you know much, much stronger than an eight. And uh, this is a example of what devastation that would uh, bring uh, it, it brought to Chile and what it would do to our region as well. Uh, next slide. So why did we focus on Burnside? Why are we focusing on the Burnside Bridge when we have other bridges in the downtown area? Uh, this slide kind of gets to that story. Uh, there's two main reasons. Um, one is uh, ODOT has to worry about the whole state of Oregon and Multnomah County. Our responsibility is just Multnomah County. So as ODOT looks at this uh, risk, uh, they have decided to invest their resources, which are limited like ours are, uh, in the I-205 corridor. This is where they're focused on for the next 10 years or so. And there are projects that ODOT is engaged in to really make I-205 a resilient earthquake-proof route. Uh, and that's a north-south freeway. It's a, a newer freeway than I-5 in most sections. And it has a newer bridge over the river to Washington State. They're gonna be investing in the Abernathy Bridge across the Willamette River down in West Lynn. Um, that's good news for you know, the region, but it, it isn't good news for downtown because they don't have the resources to upgrade some of their downtown bridges. So Multnomah County is the other bridge owner in the uh, central city. We have four drawbridges in the central city. And of those four, only the Burnside is on what's called a regional lifeline route. And this map that we're looking at shows where those lifeline routes are for our uh, central metropolitan region. Uh, it includes freeways, highways, and some major roads like Burnside. Uh, Burnside is shown on this map in yellow. Uh, Burnside starts in Gresham, and it goes all the way over the West Hills and turns into Barnes Road when it enters Washington County. And on this map, uh, you see a lot of red dots, and those dots are to signify structures such as overpasses and bridges that are on these lifeline routes that are not up to today's uh, seismic code. So that's a kind of a worrisome fact. You know, we see a lot of red dots on some of these roads that are supposed to be, you know, uh, dependable in a major disaster. And uh, they're not ready for that role quite yet. Uh, but Burnside, shown in yellow, is a, a pretty resilient route. You know, it's, um, it's a pretty wide road. It doesn't have overpasses above it that will fall down on it. And except for the Burnside Bridge, it's, it's looking in pretty good shape. Uh, we would hope that if we can re replace the Burnside Bridge, that uh, other agencies, including City of Portland, would be able to make smaller investments to make uh, some of those little tunnels up in the West Hills more reliable in an earthquake. Um, so that's why Burnside was chosen. We did look at other bridges like the Morrison, but Burnside is really uh, the most reliable seismic route that has a county bridge on it, lifeline route, I should say. Uh, next slide, please. So there's three major purposes of this project. Uh, and th think about these as we get into the cost saving ideas that Steve's gonna describe after I, I'm done. Um, so number one is we want the Burnside Bridge to be usable the day of the big earthquake. And that's a promise that is um, an important one. Uh, we have other recent bridges that have been built in the uh, Portland area. Uh, the county's own Selwood Bridge, You know, we think that bridge will be uh, still standing, but there's a concern about landslides on Highway 43, so you might not be able to get to it because of the landslides. Uh, there's also the Tillicum Crossing. Uh, that bridge is ex expected to still be standing, but there, we're expecting some settlement uh, on the approaches to that bridge, so it might not be usable for weeks. Uh, so we want the Burnside Bridge to be usable the day of the big earthquake. The second bullet really re refers to what happens after the earthquake. Uh, there will be uh, possibly just one bridge in the central city that will be really important to keep uh, goods flowing, to keep you know, debris removal going. And the goal is to keep the economy going while we rebuild. Uh, an example I often use here is uh, after Hurricane Katrina, the region of New Orleans lost about one third of its population and one third of its jobs. And I think they're just about now getting back to their uh, pre-Katrina population. So that's a 
devastating thing to happen to a region. We want to avoid that. And this bridge could be help, helpful in helping us hold on to our population and our jobs. The third bullet here is sort of the lucky bullet. Um, if we're lucky and this earthquake doesn't happen for 50 or 100 years, um, that is good news for us all. Um, but we also know that the Burnside Bridge is 95 years old today, and this project could make it a reliable crossing, even if the earthquake doesn't happen for the next 100 years. So um, even without the earthquake risk, we think uh, the Burnside Bridge needs a major upgrade to uh, be a reliable crossing for the next 100 years. Uh, next slide, please. So we're here today to talk about some cost uh, situations. And um, this is actually also about what, where we've been in the past. So I'll, pardon me, I was jumping to a, a future slide. So in terms of where we are, we started off in 2017 after we um, passed a long range capital plan for the, the county's bridges that identified Burnside as a priority. We started off with a feasibility study where we looked at a hundred different river crossing options. And uh, we had a screening tool and we worked with a task force of citizens and we got down to four options uh, that we were gonna study in this current phase that we're still in. And we do that because it's really expensive to evaluate each of these alternatives, all their different impacts to the human environment, the natural environment. Um, so we're currently in this uh, environmental review phase that's shown in this next series of bullets. So we, we've studied the pos positive and negative uh, impacts of the four alternatives. We've settled on a preferred alternative that has really broad public support. 88% of more than 6,000 people that took our survey said this long span replacement option is uh, the best alternative. It's the lowest cost. It does the best in the seismic event. Then we, earlier this year, we published our draft environmental impact statement, but based on the cost information we're getting, we've decided to sort of extend this planning phase and look at bringing down that cost with a few refinements so that we can hopefully be more likely the project will get funded and built. So today we're gathering uh, information on those cost saving ideas and we'll get to those shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of sums up our schedule. Um, time is money in all fields of uh, pursuit. Uh, we know that we're taking a little bit more time in this planning phase to look at these cost saving ideas, but we think that time is gonna be well worth it because if we're successful, we could shave about $200 million off of our, our old uh, price for the project. And that could make it much more likely that the project can be competitive and get funded and built. So this planning phase won't end until um, late 2022. Then there's about a, three years of design and then about four to five years of construction. Uh, so it's about four years away from starting to construct a new Burnside Bridge. Uh, fortunately, we have money to get through these early phases, but we do need a big chunk of money to get the construction completed. So we'll be focusing on that. And frankly, more time is helpful as we pursue those uh, dollars that we need to uh, complete our funding package. Next slide, please. This is the slide I was getting to earlier. So we're here today to talk about cost-saving ideas. Why is that? Uh, up until this year, we weren't really focused on cost. A few things have happened in the last year to force us to seriously look at cost. Number one was we had a ballot measure last November in our region that would have funded a number of transportation projects. The most uh, famous one was probably the Southwest Corridor Light Rail uh, from Portland down to uh, Tualatin. Um, if that had passed, we would have received 150 million for this Burnside Bridge replacement. It did not pass. So that put sort of a damper on the funds we were hoping to get. There's also some other large transportation projects in the region and we're all competing for the same limited amount of funds. Um, luckily, the federal government you know, now has the, the Biden infrastructure package. That is good news that could help remedy this funding shortfall. But we're told by our experts in uh, funding and our congressional representatives in Washington that if we can bring our price tag down, it's more likely that we can close this funding gap. Um, and finally, the third bullet there is about something that every field seems to be experiencing, which is the COVID price spikes. So the costs of everything and the labor of everything seems to be increased 
We don't know if that will uh, come back down to earth and uh, settle down and be the cost may come down by the time we get to construction. But we do know that if we had to build this project uh, this year, uh, the cost estimates were closing in on a billion dollars. So we're trying to get that down to that more like that 800 million range um, with this cost saving exercise we're going through. So the county still committed to uh, this project. Our leaders uh, want it to happen. And they have told us to look seriously at bringing the cost down. And our team has worked on some ideas that we're gonna be sharing with you tonight um, to do that. And down there at the bottom is uh, that price range. We're hoping to get it down into that 800 to $900 million range. Next slide, please. So I got one, one or two slides and I'll hand it over to Steve um, just to kind of set up uh, the approach to the cost saving. Next slide, please. So whenever you're making a purchase and you find out you don't have enough money to get the thing you really wanted, let's say it's that uh, two bedroom house with the two bathrooms or the the car with the leather seats, you know, you got to ask yourself, what is the most important thing when I make this purchase? So what are the things we're not going to sacrifice on? This slide kind of gets to some of those points. So number one, the preferred alternative that we have with us, this long span replacement alternative, we're going to stick with that. I, as I mentioned earlier, it is the least expensive of the four that we've studied. It also seems to do the best in a major earthquake. So the problem isn't the alternative we chose. We think the cost is being driven by some other factors that we're looking to address and sharing with you tonight. Uh, also, you could also save money if you didn't make the bridge quite as strong and stout to perform as well in an earthquake. And when we brought that option to our leaders, they said, no way, we are sticking with this promise that this is the bridge you can count on that will be open the day of the big earthquake. So that implies cost, but we're going to stick with that because that's sort of the central promise we're making with this uh, project. And that will help us with these other bullets about being there to help our region recover and being there for the next hundred years or more as uh, a bridge in our central city. Uh, the final bullet here is really about when you look for cost savings, we don't want to trim things that affect the people in our community who maybe have the least amount of power. Um, an example I use around this equity lens concept is um, a lot of people with disabilities use the Burnside Bridge. Um, if you cross the Burnside Bridge, you, you'll notice there's a lot of social service agencies, especially at the downtown, at the west end side of the bridge. A lot of people with wheelchairs using the bridge. So we want to make sure that it's uh, accessible for people with disabilities, for example. So we want to we don't want to trim the budget in areas like that if we can avoid it. Uh, and next slide. I think this is where I hand it off to Steve. So Mike did an awesome job of setting up the context and I wanna focus on a word that and a phrase he just used, the county's promise to create a facility that's seismically resilient. And unfortunately achieving that promise is uh, a byproduct of, is it affordable? And so this uh, process of cost saving refinements is truly at the crossroads of honoring that promise of a seismically resilient structure, the bridge that can be counted on, the bridge so that after the earthquake, no one is stranded on one side of the river or the other. There's a way to get across, um, coupled with how do you actually pay for it, given all the economic drivers and the conditions that's in. So because of that, county leadership um, told our team, um, and we'll show what that means in a little bit later here, um, we need to get to a project that's affordable get to a project that despite the fact that it might not be everything that was maybe originally desired, it achieves the principal purpose of that seismic resiliency. And so that's really the study, the discussion we have for cost saving refinements. And um, through all of our conversations, um, I think even the county wishes that there is either A, a less expensive option to achieve that promise or B, um, building what the original plan was, was just less expensive. Um, but at this moment, it's not in large part because of all those reasons that Mike talked about, the economic conditions, the COVID price, uh, but there's still hope down the road. So that price range of 825 to 915 million 
is based on the current projections, but there's a lot of uncertainty between now and the start of construction in you know, roughly 2025. So um, there's still hope that things could change. So I wanna start with that prelude before we get into all the details of what do these cost refinements mean? So, so this screen, um, as detailed as it is, this table really consists of three separate parts. The bridge width, which it carries with it a pretty significant cost savings, 140 to 165 million which is really broken into two pieces. What's the width and number of lanes for vehicles? And the existing bridge has five lanes. The original assumption that we developed was for five lanes. Well, the cost saving measure is to reduce that down to four. And that has some ramifications. We'll talk about that in a few slides. And there's also the bike pet space on either side of the bridge. So right now the plan is to have, um, and it really was always the plan, to have dedicated directional bike pad space on both sides of the bridge, that plan is still in place. The question is the width of it. And so the original uh, cross section at 20 feet in each direction, now being studied between 14 and 17. As context, 14 feet is the same width for the bike pad space in either direction on Tillicum. And so that was one of the questions that, that was uh, Mike alluded to asking the county, where is the minimum place? And 14 feet was that minimum the study is up to 17 feet and has ramifications to the to the overall width. So, so that's the clear of the granddaddy of all the cost savings. We then looked at the west approach bridge type. The west approach, as you'll see in a second, is really on the downtown side of the river and what it means to approach the main river span, the movable span, which is number three, and what kind of movable span is this going to be? Some people have asked, well, why do you have to have a movable span? Why don't you just raise the bridge up and have a fixed bridge and never have to deal with the mechanical electrical equipment and the movements of a movable span. Well, the reality is the vertical clearance for ship navigation has to be upwards of 140 feet higher than where it is, or 140 feet of clearance. And so what that does is it places a fixed bridge so high up in the air that it extends way out both east and west to the point where it's a much more cost uh, costly option. So the movable span really is the most cost effective. So the question is what type should it be? and we'll show what that means in a second. Um, the east span, it's not numbered at the bottom of the page, is a, a still a to be determined based on the bridge type um, for, the, for the span that goes over the eastern half of the river, over the freeway, I-5 and I-84 ramps, over the UPR railroad, even over part of the on-land facility. So we'll show some pictures of what that means. The takeaway though, is that structure type isn't gonna be decided until the final design phase, which is really um, latter part of 2022, most likely into 2023 before that's ever selected. So this is a precursor to the numbers and we'll get into what do all these numbers really mean from a, from a graphic standpoint here in a sec. But we'll start with the West approach and really an overview of these three bridges in one. Um, so on this picture, downtown is on the left-hand side. You can see all of the awesome historic buildings that are in the downtown historic district, running along Waterfront Park. Uh, the Willamette well, River itself north is up the page. Um, you can see the steel bridge um, and the Broadway Bridge in the distance. You then have the main movable span, the main uh, river span right now with the Baskill, meaning a rotating bridge that lifts uh, and rotates to open to traffic, uh, navigation traffic. And then you have a longer east approach that again spans over the river, the freeway, railroad off the screen and beyond. So each of these have different functions, have different span lengths. And the response then from a bridge designer standpoint um, has to characterize and, and respond to each of these different dimensions and needs. So as we dive in, uh, we first started looking at how might this long span, and really the long span has to do with an above deck system because it's much longer and therefore you need the, the structural system to be above the deck. How might that work on the east side and how might that work on the west side if that makes some sense? So we looked at tight arches and a modern version of the tight arches on the right side of the page. We looked at cable stays like the Tilikum, modern version of that outside the Tilikum or different than the Tilikum is on the right side of the page. And then we looked at for the west approach, a girder system. And the hallmark of the girder system is that you don't have any above the deck structural systems like you do for the tight arch or cable stay versions. It's really all below, much like what's out there today. So the other characteristic is open views above. So while this is applicable on the west side because you don't have the same side of vertical clearance constraints below the bridge, 
it's really not applicable on the east side because of all of those print lanes of traffic and crossing over the railroad. You can't, you can't, you don't have a, a uh, enough vertical clearance to have a thick enough deck structure on the east side. So the east side is always going to be some form of a long span option. Uh, but these are the basic kinds of structure types. We've actually looked at a few others that aren't on the screen that were dismissed as part of the public process. But these are the the options that are really in contention as we're getting into the details. So focusing on the west approach, this is a view if you're standing in Waterfront Park looking to the north, you can obviously see the Portland, Oregon sign off to the left. You can see how much open view there is, the girder style um, built in 1926 bridge made out of uh, reinforced concrete, a series of different support locations, quite a few of them actually in Waterfront Park that creates these individual portals that most people are accustomed to. Well, as we've been looking at different options, uh, we uh, landed on a girder option for the West approach, but it's different than what's out there. Different because the number of supports is much less. It actually has two fewer support uh, systems, columns, and vents in bridge engineering world. Uh, what that allows us to do using modern technology is gain more vertical clearance. So this height is actually greater than what is out there today and a much wider space between supports. And so there's actually more functional usable space within Waterfront Park with this girder option. The other thing it does is it preserves that open view, you know, those same views of the Portland, Oregon sign. And when we talked about this with the regulatory agencies, that necessity to preserve and not degrade the historic district because of what might be in Waterfront Park or adjacent to it was paramount to the point where we were given a word that it was highly unlikely that we'd be able to permit anything but a girder option uh, for the West approach. Then on top of it, it saves um, some decent money, tw between 20 and $40 million compared to anything you would build above the deck. So for a lot of different reasons, uh, the recommendation for the West approach is to use this girder style option. And the picture that everyone is seeing here is really just a massing model. What it really means is a concept. Uh, in final design is when really the uh, bridge aesthetics and architectural features will come into play and this the look and feel of this particular space and bridge uh, could be very different than what it is today. We developed all these massing models to help understand and get to a type selection decision uh, during this environmental study phase. So this is the west approach and as we then incrementally move from west to east we then get into the movable span portion of the bridge the part over the river and some of the modern types of movable spans are shown on this slide. A lift bridge with its characteristic individual towers that serve uh, to hold the different um, well, gears and pinions and ropes to literally lift vertically this bridge deck over the river span. Um, and it has to be put to a height so that that clearance envelope, I mentioned about 140 feet, um, is achieved by raising this up to that point. So these towers being quite high is gonna be a hallmark of any lift option that we've been looking at for the site. On the right-hand side is a bascule. This is really comparable to what's out there today. Again, that rotating option as opposed to a lift option. The difference with this picture is this triangular shape for the piers It's called a delta pier. Delta, really the shape of a triangle. In this case, that delta pier is able to spring out over the river a little bit so that that movable span actually isn't as long. And so this is an option that we are looking at as part of our concepts as well. So we looked at a whole slew of other different kinds of movable bridges. These are really the most feasible and reasonable for this particular site. Um, there's different configurations, but we've been you know, studying those for, for quite a while. So as we look at these different options and start to picture these options at this particular site, we chose this particular view. It's a, it's a pretty um, common view. It's really right next to, uh, in Waterfront Park, the Ankeny pump station. And so many, many people have taken this picture looking Northeast from Waterfront Park. So we've developed similar types of massing models to represent what could be as you combine either the lift or bascule movable with a tight arch or a cable stay on the far east side. And so there's four graphics coming up that represent these different concepts. 
So the first, the tight arch with bascule, as the name shows at the bottom, you can see the girder framing in over the waterfront park span, the bascule span. So this is where it pivots off of each of the piers. So it rotates up off of each of the piers, um, just like is out there today. And then a tight arch for this longer span on the east side of the river. So the characteristics of this, similar to what we talked about before, open views above the deck. And yet you still have a longer span with something above the deck because it has to um, span so many different facilities for at least 650 feet or more. Um, that's the hallmark of this tight arc. So this is concept number one. We then replace or modify the bascule in the middle with a lift. As you toggle to this screen, you can really see how the lift towers influence the look and feel of the site. And again, these lift towers um, in this graphic are sized appropriately. Within each of these towers, you have to have a big counterweight that's basically equivalent to a quarter or one fourth of this overall span weight. And so as that weight drops through the middle of the tower, the bridge lifts up. And so that combination of a lift with this tight arch is the other concept that we were considering. And we went back and said, okay, along with the bascule version, let's couple it with a cable stay. Cable stay inherently is some sort of a lighter look than the tight arch, you know, similar to Tilikum. And this concept of a cable stay, again, is just one concept of different cable stay varieties that, that could be chosen. This is really a goalpost style that's pretty um, characteristic of a bridge of this type. And then you couple this instead of the bascule with another lift tower. And again, you can see that relative difference in the visual masking that appears over the site. So as we went um, and moved forward with these different options, brought them to community groups, we offer, um, again, this is a place where uh, you can go to the online open house and present your response to these different options. What we heard though from the permitting agency is really making sure that this open space above the bridge deck, uh, preserving that open space was very, very important, especially because it has an influence again on the characteristic of the historic district, even on the west side. So uh, we have a lot of different people give us their inputs on this. We again offer that this is a place for anyone listening here to go online to provide their insights to it. Um, and our recommendation would be to move forward with this bascule style, preserving the open space, that rotating option. Um, not to mention the fact that it saves some money. It saves between 25 and $35 million versus those options with the taller towers on it. So from a number of different reasons, uh, the project team is recommending moving forward with this bascule style movable bridge. But we are seeking the public's input on this. So the one thing that we are not recommending for a decision at this moment, and I alluded to this earlier, the tide arch versus the cable stay on that far eastern portion of the span. That's something that would be deferred until the final design phase when there's frankly more information about cost, more information about how is a contractor going to really build it. Because it's complicated. It's complicated to build either one of these bridge types over all of that live traffic on I-5, over an active railroad, over the river, um, and land onto these piers. So quite a bit of information that's still to be learned and still to be gained with the help of a contractor. It's a more informed, better decision, again, to be decided uh, during the final design phase. All right, so with that, we wanna to go to bridge width and the bridge width itself, you know, I mentioned earlier is the sort of the granddaddy of all the cost saving ideas. Uh, this is the different array of different cross sections that we've been considering at some point. So the existing cross section, if you go out there today and took a tape measure, you would find these basic dimensions between the bike head space and the roadway width um, with different um, widths for uh, lane configurations. There's a bus only lane that's out there today and then four other general purpose lanes, two in each direction. Originally, we looked at mimicking the same number of lanes and configurations, a little wider space, uh, both to the lanes and to the shoulders than what might exist out there today. And then certainly a wider space for bikes and pets. Unfortunately, this is the cross section that while everybody seemed to like it, just frankly is outside of the affordability range of what the project can afford. And so the next step was to go back, follow the direction of county leadership and develop a cross section that achieves that seismic resiliency 
while uh, building back four lanes rather than five and building back um, still a greater amount of bike pit space than the existing, but maybe not as much as that DEIS cross section. And so that's where this, this cross save, cost saving comes in. Now the question is, how do you account for different directionality, the lane allocations? How are you, how are you placing the lanes within that roadway width? And then how it is, therefore, bike pit space interact with that. So we've been looking at some options and I'll run through this video in a second. It starts off with the initial preferred alternative, that DEIS, that middle graphic from the last slide. And then it'll slowly squeeze the cross section down to match what that bottom graphic was. So I'll play this and you'll see that a lane in the middle will start to fade away. So reduce it from five lanes down to four lanes and there's an adjustment to the bike pet space on either side. I'll play that one more time, just because I think this is kind of cool, a little slick little video um, of showing the relative difference between what that um, prior cross-section was to what we're looking at now. And so this adjustment to the cross-section is really one of the things we want to get your feedback on. So the online open house has some questions for the public to weigh in on about that cross-section. And this graphic really sums up the variables that go with the different way the bridge is configured, the overall cross-section. If you were to sum 14, 50, 50, and 14, you would get the same answer as 17 plus 44 plus 17. So really what that means is with the same overall out-to-out bridge width, there are different ways to partition that space to get some sort of different roadway width uh, relative to the bike pad space. And so there's a number of different things that we're studying. And at the uh, end of the environmental analysis phase, uh, we're hoping that there's a decision on how this allocation could be made, or at least at a minimum, the allocation of the different ways in which the link configurations can be placed. And so in this particular graphic, it's interesting, we're showing a future streetcar in one direction, um, a future streetcar, uh, in the bus only lane in the eastbound direction and some different ways to consider traffic. But these are not the only ways to consider the way traffic will be placed. In fact, we have four different ways in which the traffic can be placed. The first is what we're calling balanced. And what this means is two lanes westbound. And the trick to all these graphics, by the way, is looking at the colored arrows. If you look at the orange arrows, down means westbound. And then the blue up means eastbound. And so in this case, it's... Um, one set of, of direction uh, lanes going westbound versus eastbound, maintaining the bus only lane, or you can flip it and have more lanes going permanently eastbound. And with all of these, there is a, there's a way to consider bikes and ped spaces that, that could be accommodated within these different lane spaces. The unique option is the reversible lane. And this is something that um, when tailored, you can actually have two directions eastbound at night when there's the most traffic, and you can have two lanes westbound going into downtown when there's the most traffic in the morning. And so you can tailor the timing of when this reversible lane fits so that you can maximize the amount of traffic that can use the bridge. So it's a, it's a way to achieve almost the same operations that are out there today. It's just with a reversible lane. And the last option is a bus queue jump. And while this looks great in this cross-sectional view, it really has some challenges and requires a particular partial widening at the very ends of the bridge as evidenced by this graphic. So you would have two lanes going in each direction, but at the very end, you would have a dedicated bus only lane. And so the sacrifice on this particular option is that you don't have that bus only lane across the bridge in the eastbound direction. And that's very important to the city. It's very important to TriMet. Um, and at some times of the day, if traffic backs up far enough, it could actually block that, that little bus queue jump lane to the point where the bus then has to wait for all of the cars to get out of the way so it can actually get in. So in a lot of ways, there could be times where this is really kind of an ineffective solution. So it might not be as, um, as productive as some of the others, especially the reversible. And then one of the last slides I have is this reversible lane option. This is, I think, a, a reasonable one graphic for what the reversible lane could be. The key is look at the color coding X's versus the green arrow to tell you what lane you should be in. 
Also note that there is a gate to help remind people, yeah, you've got to get all the way over in order to get on this bridge and stay in the correct lane. So these are the kind of uh, projects, there's a whole slew of them across the country and internationally that have used reversible lanes to maximize their space, depending on the time of day. Um, so we're learning from those. We're learning that how important is it to have these gates to help direct people in. We're learning about how safe are these things. Now, granted, this particular bridge is looking to um, have only a 25 mile an hour design speed, but um, the bottom line is uh, we're learning from other projects to go forward with. With that, I'll pass it over to Mike. Apologies about going a little long. I'll pass we it over to Mike. No worries, Steve. We're seconds away from your question, so I'll, we'll zip up to this slide. This is just reminding you that we have uh, a lot of outreach happening, and December 14 is the day we close the online open house. I think we'll leave up the link to that uh, maybe during the Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. Just have one about the next steps, I think, and then we'll uh, hand it over to Allison. Uh, so we are doing our outreach uh, November and December. Then we're going to gather all that feedback. I think we've had 900 people take our surveys so far and share that with our community task force in uh, late January. Uh, that's a group of 20 uh, citizens that uh, provide guidance to us. They'll weigh in on which of these cost-saving measures uh, they support. Uh, then in March, we'll gather the policy group, which is a group of regional elected and appointed leaders uh, from transportation agencies, state legislature, our congressional delegation, and uh, they'll also recommend which cost-saving ideas to go forward with, as well as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners uh, will be doing that. And then in April, we'll uh, publish our supplemental draft environmental impact statement, which is a federal requirement because we're looking at making some refinements to the preferred alternative. There'll be a 45-day comment period at that time. If, if you're signed up for our project updates, you'll be notified of, of that opportunity. And then we hope to wrap up this planning phase uh, towards the end of 2022 with our uh, final environmental impact statement that kind of documents what we're going to do and what the impacts are and some of our mitigation plans and then get uh, hopefully a record of decision from the Federal Highway Administration. So that's uh, where we're headed and I'll hand it back to Allison. Thanks Mike, thanks Steve. All right, so let's get into your questions. Uh, if you are joining us on the, on the Zoom link, you can access uh, the Q&A box, it should be if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, it might be on the side or the top, but you can uh, press that button and type in a question and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So we have a couple of questions about funding. So let's start there. Uh, Mike, you kindly answered a question that, that someone brought up, but there's a question that was asked, what's the likelihood that this project will get some funding from the infrastructure package? And maybe Mike, you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, the money that we have is all from Multnomah County residents at this time. And we think that it'll total up to about $300 million over the life of the project. We don't have 300 million in, in the bank now, but that's the forecast for, from the revenue from our vehicle registration fee. So while that's not anywhere near 800 that we, the total that we need, it is a, a good chunk of money. And it will help us, we think, get uh, money from other parties, such as the state and federal government. The federal government is really where we're focusing our efforts at this time because of such things as the infrastructure bill that just passed. I think the chances are strong that we will uh, get some of that money. Um, you know, it just became law about a week or two ago, and then there'll be a process to figure, it, figure out uh, the, the application process for each state. So there's webinars that are being announced for that, kind of like we're doing tonight, um, and we'll be uh, participating in that. We have applied for a couple of federal uh, funds this year, which has been great experience for us to kind of learn the ropes there. We didn't get that money, but um, the insiders tell us that just uh, the experience of having the uh, Federal Highway Administration see your application and start to understand your project is all uh, time that's well spent. So. Bottom line is I think it's a, a really good uh, chance we're gonna get some federal money. The state, on the other hand, has been sort of focused on other crises. You know, we had the wildfires in 2020, COVID, we've got health issues, we've got eviction issues. We're hoping that the state will uh, get more into transportation 
uh, in the next few years. Thanks, Mike. Um, there was another question that you typed out an answer to that maybe you could just reference for folks. You know, there, there is a lot of talk if uh, we've got transportation nerds out there, which I think we might in the audience, about uh, congestion pricing and this idea of highway tolling in Oregon. And we had a question asking if that tolling mechanism could be a viable option for uh, helping to fund this project. Maybe you could say just briefly uh, the synopsis of your answer that you typed out. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, it was a great question. It's a highly controversial uh, topic too. Um, so the, the way tolling works now, it's really electronic tolling. The days of the toll booth are kind of past us. And if you visit other metropolitan regions like the Bay Area or Seattle, you probably have uh, received a little mailing after your visit with a little bill for uh, the, the bridges or freeways you used. Um, so you know that technology is out there. Oregon is sort of late to the party with electronic tolling. It'll be a big uh, cultural shift. It'll be a big infrastructure implementation task. The state is sort of leading that effort. It sounds like I-205 is gonna be first. Sections of I-5 will likely follow. Once that infrastructure exists, the practical question of could we do it is, is uh, kind of answered. I think other agencies could piggyback onto that uh, system and uh, raise money that way. But I think politically, there's a big question. You know, We have a fee right now that Multnomah County vehicle owners are paying that funds this project. And it would be ideal if we could kind of only have the people from outside the county pay a toll because people in Multnomah County are already paying one uh, via the, the, the vehicle fee. So it, that's kind of a thorny issue. I think it's also so far away that it doesn't really help us in the next couple of years. It, you know, it's gonna be several years before the state gets their tolling going. But, you know, I would look to it in the future as a, as a funding opportunity because the gas tax, you know, as fuel efficiency increases, it's just a declining uh, source of funds for transportation. Thanks, Mike. So let's get into uh, another kind of juicy part of the presentation this evening, and that's about the lane configurations. Um, there's a couple of questions in here, and I'm gonna invite my panelists to, to read some of those that you might be able to weave in your answers here. But let's start with the bike and pedestrian paths on either side. There was a question that we got asking if, if it's a requirement to have bike and ped facilities on each side of the bridge. Um, and if, you know, if that might provide some opportunities. And then we also have some questions that maybe we can deeper dive into asking about, um, you know, are, are we really prioritizing uh, or giving ample opportunity for uh, people walking and cycling across the bridge um, and especially how that aligns with climate goals? So let's start with, do we have to have bike and pedestrian facilities on e either side of the bridge? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more there and then we can take the rest. Yeah, I'd like to share the stage with my colleague, Steve. So Steve, maybe you could take the one about the wisdom of having uh, facilities on each side of the bridge as opposed to um, an idea that we've heard several times recently in briefings about, could you save money by putting the bikes and pedestrians all on one side? Sure. Uh, so first, the simple answer is, do you need to have enough bicycle pedestrian space for directional movement? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is a high priority route, a designated facility, Burnside uh, Street itself um, for the city. And so providing ample space for bicycle pedestrians moving in both the westbound and eastbound directions is a priority. Um, we looked at originally this question of can you place all of it onto one side of the bridge or the other side of the bridge? Um, there are two, frankly, fundamental issues that come with that. Number one is how do you actually get from the existing bicycle pedestrian network onto just one side. And so it creates some um, additional potential safety or duration um, or delay based distance movements that are a bit out of direction. The other real issue though, is the logistics of how do you actually make that work within all of the building quadrants on all four corners. So there are constraints because of existing facilities on, on really three of the four sides on one corner, we're gonna be um, having to remove one of the buildings to, to build this project. But because of the conflicts with the buildings, there are actually some fairly tight spaces where you wouldn't be able to fit the kind of um, multi-directional single side facility that you might like. So we, we did look at that because that was an option to 
try to say, you know, is that a better uh, solution than what we're currently shown? Through that study and in collaboration with the city, the, the ultimate answer was no. It's better to have the a separate facilities on either side, both from a safety standpoint, standpoint and just how it fits better with the connectivity to the existing system. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we had a question from uh, Andrew asking about in, in the event of a catastrophic earthquake in the region, um, it, they're assuming that private cars likely won't be using the bridge right after an earthquake uh, because the priority will be for disaster response for the supply and rebuilding vehicles. And probably cars won't be able to get through a lot of locations. So it seems like you'd have a lot more people biking and potentially walking across the river. Um, and they're noting that there are some conflicts right now on the 14 foot telecom paths, even though you know traffic is pretty low level. So is that anything that the team has taken into consideration or thinking about those bottlenecks? And Mike, I see your hand, maybe you wanna take this one? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I know Andrew and I respect that, uh, that perspective he has. Uh, if we had the money, I think we would want to do the even wider uh, bike and ped facilities that we originally proposed. But so um, sort of everybody's getting a haircut, all the different modes, and actually the bike and pedestrians are actually getting more space than is there today uh, with this plan. But um, this question about what happens after the earthquake and would those bike ped facilities be wide enough? In my experience, and I've talked with our emergency managers about what would happen after the earthquake if this is the only bridge in town. And they tell us that, you know, kind of the way you use the bridge today kind of maybe goes out the window for those critical weeks and months after the earthquake. Um, it will largely be, you, know, you can picture uh, police out there directing traffic. I think that that bus only lane is probably not a bus only lane in the month after the earthquake. It's probably uh, needed for uh, more than just buses. It could be uh, that one of the lanes is designated for additional bike traffic. Because I think Andrew makes a point that, uh, and I've heard this from emergency managers too, that uh, in those initial days after the earthquake, the amount of debris that needs to be cleaned up um, is such a, to such an extent that car travel is uh, challenging. And those of us that have a bike or, or can walk will be um, getting around with the, that means. So um, I do think there's flexibility. You don't have to think of the bridge being used only the way it is normally after the earthquake because. Um, it will probably not be used the way it is today. And that's just an interim uh, phase. Exactly. And Steve. Yeah. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm gonna give a, a personal anecdotal story. So I used to, when I first came out of college, um, many, many moons ago, uh, my first employment was for FEMA following the, the 1994 um, Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles. And so Los Angeles, you know, prone to lots of earthquakes, very prepared, especially relative terms to uh, to here. And so the question of what to expect following an earthquake is some chaos. I mean, I think this, there's sort of a the reality that that's going to set in. Lots of debris and debris management. And so, yeah, those vehicular lanes are likely not going to be used if you can even get to them. The lucky few that can, you know, maybe you can use those immediately, but it's going to be hard to go beyond that. The question is, to Mike's point, weeks and months when debris clearing happens and the sense of a little bit of normalcy starts to come back in. Again, part of, part of resiliency and recovery is having operable businesses, food, water, shelter on both sides of the river. And so it's, it's, there is gonna be a time when it's really shut down um, to government agencies. Um, then there's going to be going to be debris management. Then there's going to be a, a sort of an ongoing opening process. This bridge is designed for 100 years, and it's designed to be immediately operable following the earthquake. So when we think of immediately following, that is one condition that, frankly, not many people are going to be prepared for. But you think a year after that date, you'll be starting to get back to quasi-normal and more used to it. And if this earthquake happens in 20 years, that means there's an 80 year expectation of life beyond it. So it's one of these things that we're balancing about the different conditions that this bridge is gonna be in. And there's always an option to frankly restripe with whatever the condition is to allow differing uses. And if it makes more sense to say, okay, don't just take one side um, or each side of the bike path, but allocate some space on the bridge deck that otherwise would have been vehicular, 
that's something that can easily be done. I've seen that happen before. So um, kind of, all, yeah, like, <laughs> like was already said, all plans are sort of out the window and people will respond, emergency management uh, folks will respond to the need for this singular crossing. Frankly, it goes back to why did we start off with a wider bridge in the first place? Well, it was for exactly this reason to help accompany this. But again, um, cost affordability has to be taken into account. So I guess we're all crossing our fingers that there's maybe a little more money that um, than exists today or forecasted today, or the cost of the bridge comes down because the economic condition changes. So. Thanks, Mike and Steve. So just so folks know, we are at 6.01 by my clock. Uh, if you need to leave, we understand you've got probably a life and other things going on, but we're going to stick around for a little longer and answer a few more questions. So I think we, we're holding uh, another half an hour and I have about six questions from folks. If you do have questions that you'd like answered, be sure to get them in and we'll stick around. So if you'd like to continue to join us. We invite you to stay for a little bit longer. Panelists, Mike and Steve, I'm going to ask you to also practice the fine art of brevity. You are both so thoughtful and so knowledgeable on this topic, but let's keep it, let's, let's focus on the questions. Um, and Mike, I'm going to pass this one. This is a little, a, a little trickier, but, you know, we had two folks ask a question about how, you know, this um, prioritizing or maintaining four general lanes of traffic for motor vehicles, how does that square with the county's climate action plan? You know, that, that plan, as one person notes, as Andrew notes, it specifically uh, says that the county should expand bicycle and pedestrian facilities. How does maintaining four lanes of traffic uh, help the county meet their climate goals? Maybe you can say a little bit more about um, any thinking on that. Great question. Uh, remember the purpose of this project is to have a bridge that's usable after the, the earthquake and um, not ha having a bridge with you know many traffic lanes could be sort of what's what's the purpose of it if it uh, if, if it's not there for the region to recover so I think uh, going from five to four might be sort of supporting the, the climate goals and expanding the bike ped facilities from what they are today to uh, what's proposed even in this uh, lower cost option. Uh, is a step towards more space for, for those uh, non-motorized modes. Thanks, Mike. Let's stay on that topic of, uh, of bike, bike lanes and, and pedestrian access and get a couple more questions. There's a question from Desi. Has there been any discussion about separating the grades of bike ped and vehicular travel similar to the lower deck of the steel bridge? Could you do anything like that to put, you know, where we have a whole different access for uh, pedestrians and cyclists? Please. We looked at that idea. Steve, do you, maybe you want to take that one? Um, yeah, actually, and this idea spawned from uh, one, of, one of our city uh, friends and said, is there a way to actually get access from the East Bank Esplanade and Waterfront Park um, so you didn't necessarily have to go all the way up to the bridge deck? The challenge on a movable bridge is you still have that movable responsibility that has to get you above a certain elevation. And so... When we looked at it, it ended up costing uh, more than what we have. Um, and one of the other challenges that comes with changing the grade, think of it as a sidewalk. If you have a grade elevation of a sidewalk that's different than a roadway, it limits the ability for future adjustment. So one of the things that as we've been having some of our multimodal working groups uh, with different agencies, having a constant plane for the bridge width um, gives you more flexibility on changing how that bridge can be used in the future. And so that was one of the strengths or benefits of keeping everything at a single plane. So kind of two different reasons why we have the cross section that we have, but we did look into that, that option. Okay, so a follow up there. And I think that this one might just go straight to Steve, uh, but Mike, feel free to weigh in. Tony asked, um, could you, or, or would the engineer entertain the idea of putting the pedestrian lanes over the bike lanes and elevating them? Does the same reasoning of keeping things on the same plane kind of uh, still apply if we're looking at raising things above the bike lane? Yeah, so I'm going to interpret this as a stacked facility where you have a stacked um, bicycle or pedestrian uh, feel. We actually looked into a stacked bridge or, as one of our original feasibility concepts. Um, it creates some logistical challenges on how do you actually get people into those different elevations. It also creates um, a, a septet issue, a safety issue, because you're putting 
either one of those two user groups within a narrow, uh, unviewable space for a pretty long duration. And the sentiment that came out of that was that um, there could be some hazards by keeping people into an enclosed or placing people into an enclosed space. So we looked at it and uh, it was dismissed. This concept of a stacked option was dismissed as part of the feasibility study. I don't know, Mike, if you recall any other uh, I'd, say, I'd, I'd say the fact that it's a movable bridge is another obstacle to doing that. The Markham and the Fremont would be examples of stacked uh, bridges, but they're not movable. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve. Okay, uh, we do have another question about bike pad access. And will the new bridge have bike pad access to the East Bank Esplanade? And will you be able to access it from both sides of the bridge? Great question. We have spent a lot of time talking with groups this year about this idea. Um, there is uh, some cool concepts that have been proposed, including one from a group called the Human Access Project that uh, has sort of a landscaped ramp that would come down from the bridge down to the esplanade. Um, that is um, you know, more costly than what we were planning. Um, it's a city facility, so it's possibly, and the city has decided to spend some money to uh, do a cost estimate on that proposal. Um, I think the short answer is we're going to do something and we are probably going to decide what that something is in 2023. Um, we, we need more time for the city and the county to kind of look at the options and, and uh, think of what, what is affordable and what, what would be the best long-term investment. But I think it's an important connection. There's currently a set of stairs there that are not accessible for people with disabilities. And we also have stairs at the west end of the bridge down to the MAC station. That are, and there's no, uh, you have to use the sidewalks if, if you're in a wheelchair to get there. Thanks, Mike. Folks, if you've got questions that you're sitting with, I know some folks have dropped off the call, but we're, we'll take them. Go ahead and type them into the Q&A if you've got any final questions. But we have a question from Chuck. Will the operator stations, uh, will there be operator stations on the Baskill piers or will the bridge be operated remotely? Tell us more about how this bridge is gonna move. Well, that's my old friend, Chuck Maggio, our retired bridge engineer, I think. So uh, hello to Chuck out there. Um, I think the county's policy is we like to have uh, humans uh, be out there. It's uh, safer. We think we can, uh, you know, when you open and close a bridge, we have videos of people doing the craziest things, um, like, you know, trying to run over the bridge when it's going up and having a, a human there that can uh, make announcements on the microphone. PA system and stop a bridge opening if if it's uh, needed. So I, I think we're going to go with a, a staffed uh, bridge operator, but we also like to uh, be able to remotely uh, operate the bridge, uh, which could be uh, good in an emergency. Thanks, Mike. Well, we've gone through all of the questions that folks have put into our Q&A box. Attendees, if you're here watching our webinar, I just gave you the ability to raise your hand. If you've been having any issues with the Q&A or you haven't been able to uh, ask your question, you can raise your hand now and I will unmute you and uh, give you an opportunity to verbally share your question. So I'll just stall for a minute and see if anybody out there would like to raise their hand. You should be able to access that by uh, hovering over that bottom ribbon on your screen or over, um, it should have a button that says raise hand. You can go ahead and click that if you do have a question that you have not been able to ask yet. Um, but as I stall for time, as a reminder, we really hope that you'll take, uh, if you haven't already, the uh, visit the online open house and take some of those survey questions. Mike said, I think we've got 900 folks who have already participated and shared their thoughts on the uh, things they'd like to see on the Burnside Bridge as we get it earthquake ready. So please do uh, visit that, um, that online open house. And oh, okay, there was a, a question. I apologize, I did not get to this. Um, There's a question about the shy distance for bicycle lanes wasn't addressed. Apologies, I think I missed that one. Let me read it out loud for our panelists. So the question is, why is there no shy distance for bicycle facilities? Cars and buses aren't expected to drive immediately next to concrete barriers. Um, or barriers. This is particularly troubling when separating between bike and ped facilities. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about some of those decisions? And it might even be helpful to bring that up. Steve, you've got it. I'll take that one. So the only reason why we're not uh, parsing out that bike pit space into shy distance 
um, bicycle, buffer space, pedestrian, shy distance is because frankly, that decision hasn't been made. I think there's a full intent to have some form of shy distance and buffer zones and all that. Um, so our focus in this NEPA analysis is environmental analysis to say, what is that space? And then with the various space options, how could it be divided to create the shy distance and buffer spaces that you're referring to? So it's not that it won't be there, it's just a matter of that as we're working through the different options of, of allocations of space, it didn't make a lot of sense to have all the permutations of each of those individual parts and pieces along with the different options that we have for what the space is. So it will come um, and it will likely be addressed uh, as a final decision as part of the final design. Early in the final design phase is one of the, you know, when you get to final design, typical section and the discrete use of space is the first thing that has to be resolved before the design commences. So it's not that it won't be, it's just not there right now. Thanks Steve for taking that. And apologies uh, for not getting that question earlier. Thanks for holding me accountable on that. Okay, we do have another question that came in. What is What speed is the bridge being designed for? How fast will motor vehicles be able to go on this bridge or slow? Uh, well, there's, Good news on that if you're a, a safety fan, which hopefully a lot of the people out there are fans of safety. Uh, we just recently convinced ODOT to lower the speed limit on the Burnside Bridge from 35 to 30. And I did mention earlier, we I think we'd had a fatality where a driver lost control, went up on the sidewalk and struck a pedestrian. That was a few years ago and uh, there was a fatality. Um, so it's 30 now. And our uh, design speed for the new bridge would be 25. So that's sort of our contribution to safety. And the, those uh, crash-worthy barriers that you saw in the drawings that Steve showed, that's something that our county leaders are committed to providing, even though that does take up some width and it does add some cost. But we've heard from cyclists that they don't feel safe having just some paint between them and uh, the traffic going by. On it. It's a fairly long bridge, too, compared to some of our other bridges. So. Thanks for that, Mike. All right, folks, I am not seeing any hands raised at the moment, and I think we've answered all of the questions that are there. Steve, would you mind putting up our final slide just so folks have been uh, contemplating whether or not they're going to visit our online open house and they're really excited and jazzed um, about that? And as you bring that up, we do have another question from Steve. Can you say more about the spring with the bascule center span? So talking about those triangle piers, will the center lift section be less than 450 inches there? But I think that might, that might be feet. Steve or Mike? Well, yeah, I'm sure it's feet. Um, when it comes to spring and the delta shaped piers, that, that question has Steve's name written all over it. So um, I, it, it is uh, feet and, uh, Steve might be able to, is there more, more to the question than was it feet or inches? Yeah, yeah, so sorry about that. As I was trying, I couldn't do two things at once. I was trying to pull the slide up and answer this question. So bottom line is that 450 foot span is not what the actual movable span will be. That's, that goes back to a, you know, we'll call it fictitious, fictitious point on the center of each of the pier. The movable span is still fairly long, almost 300 feet one of the longest in the world, just like it's out there today, one of the longest in the world at 285. Um, so it, it's gonna be less than that, but the, the bascule movable portion of it is, is getting up there. And it's one of the reasons why the size and shape of the pier is the way it is. One of the things we wanna make sure we do is preserve that same horizontal clearance that's out there for ships today into the future. So that's what's driving that notion of that delta pier so that we can reduce the overall movable span and yet still maintain that navigation clearance. Thanks, Steve. And looks like we have a, Jan got another, maybe this will be our final question for the evening, um, but looks like a suggestion and uh, a link there. If lanes need to be reallocated, maybe a road zipper truck could be used to move the median barriers like on the Golden Gate Bridge. Jan, thanks for that suggestion. Uh, team's got the link there. Have you given any thought to that, Steve, Mike? I'll uh, take this one, Mike, if you okay, want. So, yeah. so, so good news. Um, back in my days in California, I also worked on the San Diego Coronado Bay Bridge. We literally had on that bridge, 
a movable barrier, zipper trucks. I know exactly what you're talking about. You'd have two of them staggered and each of the trucks would actually shift the barrier six feet so that by the time the two trucks run through, it shifts that barrier 12 feet either way. We looked into that as part of our study. One of the things we found is those are that barrier on the inside is really most effective for high speed facilities. So when Mike answered 25 miles an hour, the, the data shows that it's really not necessary. And in some ways, by creating a tighter space for one of the lanes, you're actually almost inducing a less safe environment because of how tight the vehicle will be traveling through it. So we looked into it. Our, our findings were that for this particular site location, lower design speed, having any sort of inside barrier between the lanes is actually less effective. Um, and it takes away some of the space that otherwise would be out there. So, so our intent is not to necessarily put a barrier for that reversible lane, just because of the facility and the speed that we're at for this bridge. Maybe we can go to that uh, thank you slide. I think it's two ahead. There we go. So folks, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for your questions, for attending, for staying an extra nearly 20 minutes after our, uh, our set time for our webinar, but we really appreciate you joining in. The link to the online open house is on the screen. That's burnsidebridge.participate.online. Uh, and if you have already taken it, we hope that you share it with your friends, your neighbors, your family, your colleagues, uh, so we can get as much input as possible to help us understand kind of what, what folks are thinking out there uh, and some of the things that they like to see for an earthquake ready Burnside Bridge. Steve, Mike, Thank you so much for uh, your insight, for sharing all of the work that you're doing on the project. And of course, to our team behind the scenes who have helped to make this happen and to um, get, get folks here today. We're just really glad to be able to um, share this space with you. Folks who are here in our Zoom meeting and on YouTube. Thanks so much. We'll close it with that. Um, and team, any final words as we say good evening to, to our participants? I guess just thank you our, to our facilitator. Thank you, Allison. My pleasure. Thank All you right. everybody for the great questions.